Today I'm going to answer a question from a student by the name of, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, but his question is, can you explain a unijunction transistor? Well, they don't make these anymore, except, well, they still do. There's a type of unijunction transistor still manufactured, so I guess it's worth talking about, and it's an interesting device. So let's take a look at it, and before I do, uh, you need to understand a little bit about uh, solid state devices, so be sure to watch the video and read the material I have linked below on that to get ready to understand what a unijunction transistor is. So a unijunction transistor is essentially a piece of p-type silicon, and they attach a bar of lightly doped n-type silicon and fuse that, and where they fuse it to the p-type silicon, it, in, it uh, infuses some n-type material into it, but uh, it ends up making a p-n junction right there where it gets fused. And notice I did draw this offset because it is not put in the center. And let's get this out of the way here. And so the connections on it, we're going to have a connection here, which is going to be called base number two. And another connection here called base number one. And this connection is called the emitter. So it's a two-base device, unlike other types of transistors. In fact, some people consider this uh, more of a diode than a transistor, and I can see that. So what makes it interesting is its electrical characteristics. So let's get this out of the way to make a little graph here. And so here's our typical voltage versus current graph. So if we plot our voltage and current for a resistor, we'll find that as we increase our voltage, our current will go up at a steady rate. Notice this is a straight line, so we call that a linear device. And so if we double our voltage, we double our current. So let's say we go up to, well, let's just call this one volt here. And let's say we get uh, 0.5 amps on this particular resistor. And if we double that to two volts, we're going to go up to one amp. So doubling the voltage doubles the current and we get this straight line that makes it a linear device. With a regular diode, or should I say a silicon diode, as we increase our voltage, we're going to get a very, very tiny increase in current until we get to about a half a volt and it starts to increase and roughly between 0.7 and 0.8 volts it cascades and suddenly a very tiny change in voltage gives us a huge change in current. So that's a typical diode curve. And for the typical curve for the output of a transistor, we get a rather strange curve. If we give it a certain base current, then as we change the collector to emitter voltage, we'll get a certain amount of current and it'll just stay there pretty much steady. That's going to increase slightly, but uh, as long as this is a particular base current, I'll call that uh, X uh, I B, a certain base current, uh, as we change our base, our collector to emitter voltage, it makes only a slight change. So it's almost a flat line. If we increase our base current, if we double our base current, it's going to just move that current up. So uh, at a particular base current, it's going to have a particular collector current regardless of the collector to emitter voltage, only a slight increase. And we increase the base current again, it just increases our collector current. So those are some curves we might see for certain devices. Now we're going to look at the curve for a unijunction transistor. So as we increase the emitter to base voltage, we will see that it goes up slightly, goes up slightly, goes up slightly, sort of looks like a, a diode actually. Get a very slight increase in uh, current, but we suddenly get to a region where something funny happens. We increase the current. So I'm not, don't look at the voltage, although voltage and current are inseparably connected. Think about the current. So as we increase our current, we increase our current, we get a slight increase in voltage, but suddenly we get to a certain point where our voltage goes down as we increase our current. So our current is going up, but yet our voltage is going down. What's with that? Because normally you increase your current, you increase your voltage. It's like my old demonstration of a soda straw where you blow through it and you pinch it, and the harder you blow, the um, more voltage difference you get across it. Well, now I'm blowing harder and I'm getting less voltage across it. What's that? Well, it's weird things going on inside there. There's a little green man who's changing the resistance, if you will, but whatever. 
uh, as we increase our current, the voltage goes down. And that continues for a while, then it turns around, and then eventually starts acting more normal again, but up in this region where increasing the current causes a fairly linear increase in voltage. But what we have is this area right here between about, oh, about here and here, where increasing the current causes the voltage to go down, just the opposite of what we normally expect. So with a normal resistor, increase the voltage, increase the current, increase the voltage, increase the current. Or should I say, if we increase our current, we increase our voltage. If we increase our current, more voltage, and it's linear. But here, we have it acting the opposite of a resistor where we increase our current, our voltage goes down. So we have an area that they call, don't be confused about it, but they call this weird area where increasing the current causes the voltage to go down. Are you ready for this? Negative resistance. That sounds pretty scary, like, oh my gosh, it's the opposite of resistance. So what? No, it's not the opposite of resistance. That'll get too confusing. It's just a region where increasing the current causes the voltage to go down. And so that is the property of the unijunction transistor that's exploited. So let's make a little circuit that goes with that. So here's our UJT. Starts out looking like an FET, but our emitter connection is drawn at an angle. And there it is. And we'll put a couple of bias resistors on here. And we'll put a resistor here and a capacitor here. I'm not going to go into the particulars about how this works, but here is uh, the basic idea. So we have our voltage up here, some positive voltage, and our ground down here, the negative side of our battery. And what's going to happen is this capacitor is going to charge and the voltage is going to go up and up. And of course, that's going to cause the current into the emitter to increase. So the current goes up in the emitter as this voltage goes up, the current into the emitter goes up and up and up. And then it's going to reach that point. I'll just draw the graph here real quickly. When the current reaches this point, the voltage here suddenly drops and that's going to pull the voltage of the capacitor down. It's going to discharge the capacitor. Well, then that's going to cause the current to go back down. And so it's going to start the cycle all over again. So it's going to charge up, charge up, charge up, charge up. When it hits the negative resistance region, it's going to discharge the capacitor. That's going to drop the current, take it out of the negative resistance region, back down to here. It's going to charge, 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 charge. And it's just going to do that over and over again. So we're going to get a voltage on the capacitor. Charge, 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 discharge, charge, 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 discharge. So we get the sawtooth pattern on the capacitor. And we also get that sawtooth pattern on uh, base number two. So we get sawtooth. And on base number one, we get the opposite of that. Here we have our, our voltage going up, 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 down. And but here, uh, here we have the voltage going down, 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 up, down, 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 up. So, so we get a mirror image of the two signals there. So that's what a unijunction transistor does. And that's what they're used for is what's called a relaxation oscillator. And that's about all they're used for except they might be used to trigger a silicon controlled rectifier. So, uh, but the thing is, it's not really very controllable. They actually don't make these anymore, but they do make a device. Let's see if I can remember how to draw it off the top of my head. A device called a programmable unijunction transistor. And kind of a weird looking device it has a connection to the anode other than the normal connection. And this is basically the programming lead. And we set the trigger point where it goes into negative resistance with a voltage divider on that lead. And then the other anode connection goes over to uh, our capacitor charge circuit. I've made better drawings, but this will do. These two resistors, you have to look in the specs to know exactly how to use them, but these are used to program the trigger point. And now we have exactly the same circuit again, 
where the capacitor charges and charges and charges. When this goes into negative resistance, it discharges the capacitor. So we get that sawtooth pattern here. And we just pick off the oscillations off of that capacitor. And this can also be fed into a silicon controlled rectifier to trigger that. So we can either make a relaxation oscillator with it, or we can use it to trigger a silicon controlled rectifier and control that trigger point using this voltage divider here. So that, in a nutshell, is your unijunction transistor. And then I went on to the programmable unijunction transistor. So they're not quite dead yet. We do have the programmable version, and it does have a use other than relaxation oscillators. It can be used to control the triggering point of a silicon control rectifier. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible and a big thank you to everyone for watching.